Lord, today, take my humble words, my stumbling thoughts, and cause them to fall on the ears of those here with beauty, love, appreciation, and hope. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, pastor asked me to uh, cover for him today. He is in Monterey, enjoying friends and family. We wish him well and safe travels and return. So I don't have to do this very often. Okay, so I will stand here. John 15, 4. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye, abide in me. I know what you're thinking. Really, Melt? King James Version? You're doing that to me? I saw what was written in our little bulletin, and it had the word abide in me, but I didn't read that for our scripture. I like, I like to go back and visit the past sometimes. You know why? Because it makes me feel good. How many of you have ever attended a reunion after 20 or 30 or 40 years? You've done that? Does it make you feel younger or older? Does it make you feel exciting? Well, you see old friends? You enjoy those moments? And it's almost as if you're reliving them when you share those stories. I like to look back once in a while because it makes me feel good. Next week, I'm going to visit my mother. Now, when I am with my mother, I feel different. I feel a special blessing. I actually feel younger. I feel more responsible. I remember stories of old. And it reminds me of the care and love that's been given to me for more than 66 years. And I feel good. Today, for many of you, we're going to go back a little bit. And our discussion today, and I'm taking a risk, is focused and brought with one word in mind. The word abide. Now, when Denise and I did Bible studies for the younger people, we always shared scripture in at least three or four different versions. And it was important to do. It engendered discussion. It brought meaning, thoughtfulness, and the children responded to different versions in different ways. Some of you are like me. If you're brought up a certain way, you learn scripture a certain way from a certain source, and I was brought up with the King James Version. And I know there are many, many reasons to expand, and I find lots of glory and goodness in different versions. And in fact, my standard version is a New International Version of Scripture. But when I read John 15, 
when I read that challenge, that promise, I always fall back on the King James because of one word, the word abide. I know, taking a chance, building a theme on one single word. I don't know what Pete would think about that. He's the master of words and sentences and paragraphs and thought. But I thought, what's important to me will help me in my time with you in sharing. Webster defines the word abide, oh, to settle down. And that's okay. That's part of it, I think. Sometimes to dwell, to hang around. You heard that term, hang around? We had a little dog one time, and his name was Coco. And every time he went out in the backyard, I had the same phrase. Hang around, Coco. Hang around. We didn't have a fence in the back. So he knew he didn't need to, uh, he shouldn't escape out that uh, back way. Stick around, Terry. But really, abide is much richer. And that's why I like the King James Version. Abide denotes closeness of relationship. It infers dependence and interdependence. It means togetherness, support, comfort, safety, growth, and maturity. John 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire that they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so ye shall be my disciples. And as the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Was that hard to understand? Abide. There are tens of thousands of words in the English language. And most of the time we hear those words, hurry up, let's get it done, let's go. We tend to use words that keep us moving, going forward, and that cause us not to think about what it means to abide. Even churches often emphasize and place emphasis on busyness, being mobile, doing something. Where is the emphasis on sharing, nourishing, love, protection, 
acknowledgement, strengthening, joy. The Lord spoke the words in our text no fewer than eight times. He tells his disciples, abide with me. He's telling them it's natural to be together if you want to strengthen one another. What does it mean to you to abide personally with Jesus Christ? Is it just a concept, a figure of speech? Consider what it means to abide with Christ. You choose Christ, first of all, because he is supreme. Jesus said, I am, to Moses. When he stood at the bush, Jesus, God said, this is holy ground. When Moses was encouraging the Israelites, I was afraid. He said, I don't know what to tell them. Who's sending me? You tell Pharaoh, you tell the Israelites, it is I am that send you. This name you will use because it is my name forever. Jesus is the true vine. Jesus provided the lifeblood of redemption, that blood that was shed for you and me. Jesus wants every person to know and claim this redemptive power to be connected to the nourishment of his mercy and love to be nourished with a never-ending love because you abide with him. For those who abide in Christ, he has promised to abide, abide in them. And that promise brings forth good fruit. It's not you that produce good fruit. Jesus says, I will produce good fruit when you're connected to the vine. There's an invitation in this call to you and me as his disciples today, accepting the invitation to abide in him so he can abide with you and provide you with nourishment to carry forward his work. So what are the tangible ways we can abide in Christ? What are ways we can make that cohabitation with him alive daily in our lives. Do, do you consider every day time to abide with your Lord? Whether that's uh, through prayer, through discussion, through sharing what's going on in your life. Asking God, what is my purpose? What is your desire for me? Do you spend time with the scriptures? Abiding with Christ, learning his word. I know we have trials, hardships, tribulation, and I've discovered that's part of my abiding time with Christ. Because those are the times that help mold me, strengthen me, and teach me to be a better person. These are the activities that allow Christ to abide with us. And then he says, I with you. How can we know that Christ is abiding in us? Are we open 
to his word? What do we do with the words that he gives us? Are we listening, willing, obeying, letting go, accepting, and serving? There are benefits that are unbounding when we abide with Christ and he abides with us. From the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 14, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and in earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints that is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That describes abiding with Christ. That is the benefit that we can get. In verse 8, we, uh, we read, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. What is the primary purpose of being a disciple? Of calling ourselves Christian? By abiding in Christ, we understand God's leading and respond in kind to his plan for us. The more we abide with him, the greater our desire will be to fulfill his purpose in our lives. The more Christ abides with us and the more we abide in him, the more we learn of him and the more opportunities are brought to us to share his goodness. We're all here for a reason, a reason that God has planned. God has a purpose for your life. Have you ever come to the place in your Christian life when you would say, Lord, I no longer want to live for my gratification, my pursuits, and my ambitions. I want to fulfill your purpose for my life. What? Saying those words out loud. I no longer want to live life for my gratification, but for yours. There are more priorities than mine. When we move in that direction, we move forward in Christian maturity. When Christian life will produce fruit for the Lord, fruit that is beneficial to others, God will be honored and glorified. That is the role of a disciple. Simply put, a person abiding in Christ will understand God's purpose for their life and the life that God would have them to live. Produce good fruit. In verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Here, Jesus makes a distinction into good pruning and bad pruning. I learned that the hard way. Milt, you can work on the farm. That's great. 
I can be outdoors working on the farm. Here's your first job. We want you to go to the apple orchard and prune those trees. Let me show you. Okay, I can prune trees. The boss showed me, this is how you prune a tree, and we pruned a tree. I said, show me again, and he showed me again. I said, I got it. For the next four days, I pruned tree trees, apple trees, like no one's business. The boss came back. Milt, you've wrecked our orchard. These, these trees are pruned so far back, they're not going to be producing any good fruit. So here's what I want you to do. If you want to stay on the farm, now you have to take care of the irrigation. Hmm. Okay, how do I do that? Now, irrigation in the New Mexico desert, actually we were next to the Rio Grande, so that's not, it was close to the desert, worked this way. There were large irrigation canals that went by that were fed by the Rio Grande, that were fed by uh, pumping up from uh, the ground, other water, that went by all the time. And for the farmers, they had a gate that was attached to this large irrigation canal with a big wheel that you would turn and you would raise a little door and water would run onto your property into a smaller irrigation ditch. And that irrigation ditch then would fill up and it ran perpendicular to the rows in the fields. And what we had to do, I, have, I can't get out there and show you, okay, because I lost all my connections. Anyway, so imagine this center aisle as our irrigation ditch and water is flowing in from the main canal and it comes to an end. Well, we had to let that fill up to a certain level. And then we had stiff plastic tubes about this long, and they were curved like this. Are you with me? And we had to dip those in our irrigation ditch and block on one end, fill them full of water and block, and then quickly let them hang over the banks of our canal and run into, have water run into our fields. Does that make sense? So little physics was involved. Oh, how fun this is, right? And so every five feet, another one and another one. And then you had to measure the amount of water coming into our canal because you couldn't have it overflowing. You'd wreck the crops. So you had to get the right number of rows being fed by the water, depending on how much water came in. You have that? Here's the good part. It's done mostly at night. And so I had to walk up and down the fields on the opposite end of the little canal and look using the moonlight and other, see where the water's coming and how things are going. Well, I decided it, that was a lot of work walking up and down. So I went to the barn and got the tractor. And I'd say, I can just drive up that road and I can look and keep track of everything. Oops, ran the tractor into the ditch and turned it on its side. Next morning, here comes the boss. Milt, I don't know that you're going to be a good farmer. <laughs> here I have another job for you. And out he took a large pair of rubber boots and a large rubber bib, an apron, and rubber gloves. And he said, Milt, you're going to work in the dairy. <laughs> I trust you can milk a cow, make sure the sump pump doesn't back up, and clean the stalls. 
So that's what I did for five months. I found my place. <laughs> Every person has a God-given talent. I think I can milk cows working a dairy today. It's been a few years. I don't have a problem. But I don't think I'd be very good at pruning. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whosoever shall ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I wanted to be a good pruner. I wasn't. I wanted to be a good irrigation man. I wasn't. I needed to learn the humbleness of working on a dairy. We're the same way. God has a plan for you. Oh, we think we know what it is, but it may not be that. When you abide with God, He will show you the, purchase, the purpose for your life. He wants you to bear fruit. In Galatians 5, 22 to 25, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against there is th such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Being connected to the vine and the nourishment means abiding in Christ, and our call is to love, number one, because God is love. To joy, to understand that inner joy that God gives to you. To have peace, not peace from money, status, pills, but peace that comes from knowing that God walks beside you. Long-suffering, be steadfast under pressure. What will be thrown away from my ideas today? Gentleness, compassion to others, service to others and goodness. Gather your strength from God, and share it with others by the way you live. Meekness, power under control, temperance, self-control. Fruit bearing in the Bible involves leading people to Jesus. This is accomplished in one way, by abiding in Christ. Praise is part of abiding in Christ. Individually, how do you praise God? Is your life praise to God? Is your conversation with others a praise to God? As a church, how do we praise God? Verse 11, these things have I spoken unto you, that my joy remain in you, and that your joy might be full. I like the idea of full joy. Now, most of the time, I'm a happy guy. In fact, sometimes too kind of off a little bit do mind wanders around but I like I like to be joyful and happy I think you do too Philippians 2 5 let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus that only happens when you abide with Christ 
joy becomes a focus. Joy in Christ remains a priority as we abide with him. This joy will help develop a stronger faith in Jesus. In Psalm 18, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those who trust him. Do you like that? David has a way of saying things that are just awesome. The Lord is tried. He's perfect. He is a buckler. He's our shield. To all those that trust him or take refuge in him. To all those who abide with him. Don't be discouraged. Do you remember in the story of Nehemiah? Temple's been built. It's time to go back home. And his people were afraid to leave. They were afraid to return to the promised land. They heard again about the law and the promises that God read, what God uh, sent through Nehemiah. And they realized how far back they had fallen. They began crying and weeping. When you lose your time with Jesus over and over and over again, and that time extends out, sometimes we feel like, uh, I just can't get back in that groove again, Jesus. I, I've gone too far. And that's where the people were. But Nehemiah encouraged them. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is the holy day of our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And so Nehemiah engaged them, took them out of their despair, simply with the word joy in the Lord. Start there. Find positive. Psalm 16, thou wilt show me the path of my life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At the right hand, there are pleasures for everyone. Abiding in Christ's love. Verse 13, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life. For his friends. Friends, God in his wisdom has provided pardon, has provided forgiveness. We're all in need. Christ's sacrifice provides a pardon for all. So don't be discouraged. Look for that abiding time with Christ. Become a partner with him. Verses 14 and 15. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known to you. What a partnership. You don't have to consider yourself unworthy or a servant. God has called you a friend. That is his desire, to abide with you, and he wants you to abide with him. This love provides a true perspective of service. 
Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of my Father in my name, he will give it to you. Christ's words to those disciples are the same words for us today. The Lord has chosen us all. Abide with him. He's willing to abide with you, no matter who you are. A purpose found by abiding in Christ and a purpose lived through Christ can only be attained if you say, Lord, I love you. I'm your friend. Abide with me today.